Hey everyone, it's Q&A Tuesday. Guys, first and foremost, thank you for all your questions that are coming in. I'm getting so many that I'm getting a little bit overwhelmed. However, I'm gonna try to get as to as many as possible and try to answer them a bit faster so I can get more questions in. I apologize if I don't get to your questions quick enough. Eventually, I will get to you all your questions or I'll try to answer them on the YouTube platform itself. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Uh, first question comes from Val Sechi. Hey Roman, here's a quick question for the next episode. Why don't brands offer some customization options? If the luxury car industry can do it to the extent of fulfilling almost any desire, you would think that similar priced products from watch brands should at least let you choose a dial, color, case, material, strap, etc. How difficult can it be to implement that? Well, there is an answer in your question. You mentioned uh, case, material, strap, dial, color. Majority of brands, uh, We'll take a model and pretty much every one of those models will have the option of a different metal, whether it's white gold, yellow gold, rose gold, or platinum, uh, sometimes PVD, right? You also have a slew of different dial colors or dial combinations, if it's a chronograph, for example. You also have the option to purchase pretty much any additional strap you would like for the watch that you buy. But if you're gonna get into true, true customization where you're gonna call, let's say, uh, let's say Rolex and say, you know, I want my Daytona to have green subdials, uh, a white dial, a PVD bracelet, or something of that nature, right? It opens up a big can of worms for these companies because for one, you have to understand that, you know, these watches, even though they're all handmade and hand produced, they're still mass produced. So there's a plan in place where you have an X amount of movements, bracelets, cases, et cetera, et cetera, and it gets put together sort of in an assembly line of highly qualified watchmakers by hand, but it's still somewhat of an assembly line. So A, it would be cost prohibitive for the companies to do that, but B, what I feel is most important, again, this is my opinion, is I feel like there would be too worried about brand image. Because I don't know if, let's say, if Rolex wants a pink dial Daytona uh, running around there somewhere, or if Panerai wants to make a, a yellow bracelet or yellow strap watch, for example, or something that's really, really loud because, you know, everybody has their own taste and uh, sometimes tastes don't agree with that of the general public. So I think you will not see a whole lot of customization out there. Yes, picking a different dial, a different strap, uh, perhaps a combination of a different metal, that you may see, but what you won't see is full, complete, total control of customizing a high-end Swiss luxury made piece out there anytime soon. You do get the big boys, even like Patek Philippe, that will allow certain customers uh, customize their watch to an extent. I know a customer that ordered a Sky Moon Turbi and a rose gold with a black dial with red markers. It's the only one of its kind. At the time, he paid retail for the watch, which I think was around a million CHF. Uh, that watch probably is worth twice its value today, and the reason for that is because it's the only one made, and it says so in the papers. But in order to go that route, A, you're usually buying a very, very expensive watch, so the company will oblige, and two, you'd have to be a really, really good customer to where the company will be almost certain that you're not gonna go out there and resell that watch because it's so unique, although it still happens. Hope this helps. Next question comes from AA.IM. Hey, Roman, love the content. I'm 22 years old. I was fortunate to work and be able to buy some of my dream watches, such as AP Royal or Chronograph Stainless, Offshore Chronograph Rose Gold 44 millimeter, AP Diver Stainless Black, and the blue and yellow dial, and a few Daytonas. I was wondering, do you think an AP Millinery 4101 will fit in the collection, and what's the retail and pre-owned market on them? Thank you so much. Well, first of all, congratulations. That's a hell of a collection for a 22-year-old, so whatever you've been doing thus far, you've been doing something right, because that's a fairly expensive collection. Of course, I'm biased, AP is my favorite brand, so I love all the pieces that you mentioned, to include the 4101 that you're asking me about. Again, they trade at roughly about 30, you can even probably pick them up at 40% off retail should you decide to buy one. What's the resale value on them? Pre-owned are trading at around 10, 11. And the reason for that is because again, number one, this is a millinery, probably the second worst line from AP after the Edward PGA, which they no longer make right now. They have the jewels and the millinery, they're sort of in the same boat, again, it's that other AP. Do they sell? Yes, they absolutely do sell. And specifically, the 4101 is probably the most popular millinery out there, and the reason for that is because of the way it looks. I mean, look at the watch. It's a beautiful skeleton moving. You can see the balance wheel right up front. A lot of people can often mistake it for a turbine even, and it's somewhat reasonably priced. Again, not at retail price, but at a discount that you can get it. And again, I tell everybody the same thing, buy what you like first and foremost, and what's not to like about this watch? I love it in the steel version, and I love it in the rose gold version. It's a good 
looking watch. And it's a good dress option. If you want to put on a suit, it's kind of hard to wear your 44 uh, millimeter offshores with a suit. Something like this is indeed something that's easily worn with a suit. It can also be worn as a sporty watch just the same. So very versatile watch, a good looking watch. So my advice to you is this is something you really, really like. Go out there and get it. And as the market stands today, uh, if you pick it up brand new, for, let's say around fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars, and you go to resell it pre-owned for ten and eleven, there's your downside. Hope that answers your question. Next question comes from Zeitgeist, and I apologize if I got your name wrong. Awesome channel, thank you. I think I've watched every single video on love your no BS approach. Uh, talking about love, I do not see much of it here for one of my favorite brands, Vacheron Constantine. What is your take on Overseas and Co? Kind regards from Switzerland. Uh, very simple answer for you. Me personally, I love Vacheron Constantine because it's a brand with a lot of history. Uh, you know, it's probably top five brands in the world. Their watchmaking is superb. They have a lot of horological uh, feats under their belt going back uh, over 150 years. Um, haven't had a whole lot of Vacheron in my stock to go over. I usually do the what's on my desk and I do a hands-on on Vacheron. And the reason for that is because, remember, I'm still a business that lives off of selling watches. And right now, Vacheron is not as hot. And I'll quickly tell you why that happened. It happened about a year, year and a half ago when the Chinese market cooled off on buying Vacherons and Piaget for that matter. Um, the Asian population uh, deemed Vacheron and Piaget as quote-unquote a lucky brand. They're fairly superstitious nation and uh, they tend to follow suit when it comes to that. Right now, the overseas is probably the only models that are selling for Vacheron and Constantine. Some of the dressier stuff is somewhat dead in the water. Again, that's not that doesn't mean they're not having sales. They absolutely are. They have a strong following. They will continue having a strong following for hundreds of years to come. However, today it's not the hottest and the latest and the greatest. Probably the overseas chrono with the blue dials, the plain overseas with the blue dials is going to be your hottest selling model today. But even still, you can pick that up at a discount. Going back to what I said about the Asian market, uh, when the, you had the whole scandal about the uh, government taking bribes and so on and so forth, a lot of the Asian buyers sort of slowed down, showing off their wealth uh, with these expensive watches. And it seemed like it kind of happened overnight. It used to be that Vacheron Constantine dealer in the United States, his entire allocation may have been maybe 10 pieces of best per year and not the hottest stuff because everything used to go to Asia. I remember someone once told me that the Vacheron and the Piaget boutiques in Hong Kong did more business than all the other boutiques combined worldwide, which is pretty nuts. And then one day it just stopped. And when that happens, all of a sudden you go into any AD in the United States and every Vacheron under the sun is available to you to buy, order, etc. Uh, again, it just goes in waves. Something is popular today, it's not popular the next day, but it all does this. So you're gonna see Vacheron right back at the top a few years down the line at the cost of some other brand that may be hot today. Uh, next, next question is from Hallmark Creates. Another great video, Roman, thank you. Question, what is your favorite complication and why? Uh, I have to tell you my favorite complication is going to be the GMT and the reason is very, very simple. I travel a lot and I often travel to time zones that are so far off of my own time zone that at a glance I need to take a look at the time and see uh, what time it is at home, let's say if I'm phoning family. At the same token, I do a lot of business overseas. I do business in the Middle East, I do business in Asia, I do business in Moscow, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very easy for me at a glance to take a look at a GMT watch and see, A, what time is it elsewhere? Probably second in line would be the world time watch. Those are the two complications shouldn't say second line, I guess to, well, let's put them together, either a GMT or a world time. Again, for the very reason that it's extremely, extremely useful to me. Uh, if I had to pick a favorite GMT or how GMT is actually uh, executed, I would have to go with Ulysses Nardine plus minus GMTs. And they come in various models and combinations, perpetual GMTs, regular GMTs. You have the executive GMT, uh, you have the perpetual GMT Nardine. So though, be, just because they have the plus minus button, it's just so easy to use, that would probably be my pick for traveling. I'm gonna take one more and wrap up this episode. This one is from Alexander Oliver. Hey Roman, I just love your channel. Great work, thank you very much. I have a question for you. What do you think about Ulysse Nardine Erotica watch? The Ulysse Nardine Erotica watch as seen here is uh, something that I actually do like. Would you ever see me wearing that particular watch or any Erotica watch for that matter? And, and the slew of brands did it, Blancpain did it, uh, Jacques Droz did it, uh, Ulysse Nardine as you mentioned. There's a whole lot of brands that do do an Erotica watch once in the blue moon. Jacob & Company did it uh, just recently. I've seen it on Instagram somewhere. Um, the Erotica watch from Elise Nardine, especially the one where you see, quote unquote, the action happening on a dial, is something that is not for me personally. And the reason for that is because I have small children. 
and I'm gonna have a hard time explaining to my 10 year old or my three year old what the hell is going on on my watch. My 15 year old is already gonna get it obviously, but uh, my younger children will not. As for what do I think about the watch itself, listen, these are normally our striker watches, complex watches, they strike out the time, as well as depicting an erotic scene on the screen of the dial. The ones that have it in the back uh, are actually ones that I would consider wearing and owning because you can't really see it unless you take it off and actually show it to somebody. But the ones that have it right there in your face on a dial, it's something that you will not see me wearing. Does that mean I don't like those watches? Absolutely not. I love the watches. I love everything about them. I think it's a very cool concept. There's a lot of collectors out there that collect erotica watches from various brands. Is it something that I recommend you buy? In terms of resale value, you're gonna get hurt a little bit, and simply because there's not a big crowd out there for those Erotica watches, which is why they make them in a very, very limited production, because there's not a whole lot of buyers out there for them. But this is something that uh, floats your boat. By all means, get out there, pick one up. My suggestion is get out there and find one pre-owned, because you will take a beating if you get out there and buy the watch new. Well guys, that's it for me for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to comment below with the questions for the next upcoming episodes and I will try to do my best to get to answer them. As always, don't forget to hit the like button, share button, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday.